Hello, I'm Kat Sarfish, Forever Bookseller at Barnes & Noble. Today, we are joined by the brilliant Pierce Brown. Pierce is the best-selling author of the Red Rising series, which currently contains Red Rising, Golden Sun, Morning Star, Iron Gold, Dark Age, and the much-anticipated, and I have it right here, if I could, I could lift it up, <laughs> The Red You got his some biceps. That's <laughs> true. His work has been published in 34 languages and 36 territories, and if you haven't dived into this extraordinary saga, I'm not quite sure what you're waiting for, but now is the perfect time, right? Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Kat. <laughs> So Red Rising, I had to do a little date check, uh, came out in 2014, which is just kind of like, how does that uh, time is? I don't know. Uh, (laughs) I don't even know. (laughs) So fusing, we have ancient Greek and Romans with the stars. It's a space opera with all the bloody twists Mm -hmm. and betrayal. We've got epic world building, cinematic grandeur, and perfectly paced action to keep you holding your breath to the very last page. And that's just the beginning. Lightbringer, the newest installment, is book six, and it's been on a journey for our dear Daro. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. What was your inspiration to embark on this adventure? Well, having read the books, I think you know that there's a lot of inspirations. But I'd say the the ori- original inspiration was the play Antigone by Sophocles. In it, a woman named Antigone is trying to bury her brother, who is a rebel, and uh, the rebels are not to be honored. And if you bury the rebel... Um, you're supposed to be uh, executed by the state. And I thought that was, uh, it really rang a bell for me. Like it was a 2,500-year-old story, um, survived all this time. And um, I started then uh, thinking about it when I was on a hike. (laughs) Strangely enough, I was doing, uh, I was crazy enough, it was 10 years ago. So I was doing, 11 years ago now, actually. And I was doing uh, mountaineering. So I was on, I was was (laughs) going up and I was just wishing gravity was lighter because it was about like eight hours in. And I started thinking about Mars because you could see the stars so well. And Antigone had been rolling around in my head. And I saw it started conflating the two. And when I got home, I drew on a lot of other inspirations. But that was the initial seed. Um, and I really like went off like a racehorse, electrocuted, just boom, straight into the story. You know, we think about these, uh, call them classics, these, these, these works that kind of transcend time. What is it about this story? What is it about this this very human struggle that still kind of resonates today? And then I feel like, you know, add space and... Well, yeah, I mean, I, and, you know, my, my theory is any form of government we have will have a uh, tyranny of some sort. With regards to capitalism, you have tyranny of debt, you know, and uh, with regards to communism, tyranny of the bureaucracy. It seems to be a fairly consistent fact. So... You know, my way was exploring exploring that theme, and the, the idea also of Antigone was to draw on Plato's Republic, which is probably my third greatest inspiration, um, which is how I created the caste structure. You know, the ideal form of, uh, of running a city a state through democracy, and so it's it's very steeped in the ancient Greeks, I suppose. This book series, yeah, but I mean, if you look around, I think that that's sort of the, those these mythological retellings. I mean, now at least, I mean, this obviously, this was this mm-hmm. is, you're starting this idea a while back, but it is it's it's interesting to see sort of this resurgence in in the myths, and then in the, these sort of retellings, and and kind of taking these structures, taking these stories, taking them, and kind of you know understanding their very real parallels to modern times. We miss the myths because they tap into something that is inherently true about humanity or about the world. Mm-hmm. And that's why these stories last. It's not because we have any fidelity to Sophocles or, you know, we're all fans of Plato. No, it's because they somehow tap into something that we constantly revisit. That's why we are so attracted to Shakespeare as well, because there's 13 different types of stories to tell, right? And he told them all. Yep. And he told them in the, a great way. And so there's something that's always we can connect to. I mean, what do we have in common with the 2,500 year old society? Really, a lot actually. It seems. Yeah, things have things have changed, and and many things have stayed the same. Uh, mm-hmm. that's same, same, saying, but different. Yeah. Same, same, but different. <laughs> exactly. So now uh, the series sort of splits mm-hmm. into sort of uh, I kind of call it. It's like the, it's like a before and after. So mm-hmm. you have you have the rising, and then there's the the many sort of tragedies and eventual triumph, and then you have sort of the the after part, which I think is 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 great because I think a lot of times you know you read something and it's that that you know the, it has the climax, you have the ending. And then you don't really know what happens after. And so, you know, where you pick up uh, in, in Iron Gold, where things kind of start to get messy and uh, what sort of rises mm-hmm. from the ashes. So as you explore the the consequences of Darrow's Rebellion and integrating new points of view, uh, I will also say uh, increased page count. 
Oh um, God, tell me about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> What's been the biggest challenge and the highest reward for sort of going? Uh, getting gray hair through the writing of this series. <laughs> the biggest challenge, yeah. I'd say the biggest challenge is um, uh, the cognitive load of having multiple characters mm-hmm. um, who are all telling the story in first person. I think often when I see stories that have multiple characters, they're in third person or you know third person immediate or third person omniscient. And I think that first person makes it very difficult because you have to empathize and change your brain uh, to try to be true to that character. But also it's the causation. Causation I find to be very difficult, particularly when all the planets are moving around at different paces and different <laughs> different speeds. This is why like I'm aching to go to fantasy. I just want I just want everyone <laughs> to be on a landmass. One landmass. Yep. And you make all the rules. Like that's oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm like, because I'll 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 do something and then I'll be like, oh crap, Mercury is often closer to Earth than Mars is even though it's two, you know, two planets away or one planet yes. away through Venus. Right. But it's often closer um, because of how fast it orbits. And anyway, that's a ridiculous thing, but I'd say the cognitive load of getting characters, certain places, it's uh, often what uh, George R. R. Martin talks about holding him up is how does he get the Nerys Targaryen back from the East while maintaining the storylines of the other characters, because yeah. it's a long voyage. Right. And that was his, what he called his Gordian knot. And so I think that that's probably the most difficult thing. And I forgot the other part of your question. The reward. Ah, the reward. The reward is a more three-dimensional view on the world. It feels more Mm. real to me than it was just through Darrow's eyes. And there's such an advantage through, I mean, he's a god of war. You know, he's also the main character. So it's hard to kill your main character if he's your narrator, right? And so- like, is it? I feel like people- (laughs) People have done it, but yes, go on. Yeah, people have done it. People have done it. Uh, to not much approbation. The, the audience sometimes rebels against that. I'd say that it's the ability to have people with different worldviews than the main character, the protagonist, because it allows me as an author to show the reader that Darrow's worldview is not my worldview. Mm-hmm. He's a character, just like all of the other characters are characters. And then seeing how they react to Darrow's actions, how they perceive his triumphs is, like I said, the way of painting a more three-dimensional picture, but more so this entire latter series. The first three are the archetypal rise of a hero, a Mm -hmm. plucky rebellion, a grim plucky rebellion (laughs) with a lot of gallows humor, but a plucky rebellion nonetheless. And then the books from Iron Gold on four through seven are more of a meditation on the, 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 the things that Darrow has done. Because we have four POV characters in Iron Gold. One of them's Darrow, our archetypal hero. And then three people who have a bone to pick with Darrow, from all from different parts of society. And so it really is an indictment. They all indict Darrow, but the book itself is an exploration of that indictment. Yes. And to see how their interaction with the world and with his cause stands the test of time and also their own evolution. And so it's my way of exploring the world and also exploring the repercussions of archetypes. That's really interesting what you were saying about being able to kind of come out and like, this is Dara's, you know, point of view is not my point of view. My next question is, is the fans is, you know, and the the reception that you get, you know, when you're in a series and you're this deep and you have so many people who are so committed to it. I'm going to talk about your howlers um, for a little bit, but also this whole idea of, you know, TikTok and people getting, getting, you know, rallying around these books and exploring them and dissecting them. And it's kind of wonderful to see, I mean, you know, obviously, like anything, there's going to be positives and negatives um, mm. to that. But it's really interesting to have that community of readers um, being able to kind of come together. And I, I often say that I envy this, like from when I, when I was younger, like I would have loved to have a community of people to sort of bounce ideas off of and just kind of being able to talk about this book, talk about the story, talk about, you know, again, you have many points of view. Yeah. Um, you know, and kind of being able to dissect that and 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 where these people are coming from and all of that. You have an amazing fan base. And I mean, I think that these are people who have kind of, you know, started at the beginning or maybe they've come, you know, come in. I'm sure, you know, you want to give characters the ending they deserve, the ending that they you you feel like the story goes. How does that reception when you're in, when you have people who are so, I think, enthusiastic, so in, you know, entrenched in a series, does that affect your writing at all? 
Yeah, I'd say it's why the book slowed down. I, I'm extremely honored to have the fan base. It's they're mm. wild, wacky, and come from all ends of the political <laughs> spectrum. I think that it is one of the more beautiful things with mm -hmm. the, the book reading community these days. And I also would have loved to have that when I was younger, but at the same time, would I have then had needed the catharsis of creating characters? There are so many good things about having such an avid fan base like that, but I do feel as though if you read or partake or lurk in that fan base, you know, if, if I'm going onto the Reddit, if I'm going into the discords, I, I can't do it except uh, sparingly. And yeah. I have to do it like announcing of there, I can't, I can't read from the <laughs> sidelines because you get haunted by critiques. I mean, how many, uh, how many compliments have you forgotten in your life? Oh, how many, uh, how many insults have you forgotten? None. <laughs> none, none. None. And, and writers are inherently sensitive creatures, right? We're empathetic. Yeah. It's empathetic. It's empathy that allows us to go into the minds of other characters and explore these things because we're curious. And so there's a greater sensitivity there. So I think you have to be really wary about that. You know, there, I talked about the cognitive load of slowing that slowed down the series, uh, but also, you know, the expectations. You don't want to violate the earlier books and the love of those earlier books by changing and by ruining them. But at the same time, there's I have no interest in repeating something I've done before. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to reinvent the wheel each time without making it from a different substance, right? So it's like, yeah. how do you surprise the reader without violating that early contract? You know, right? And the fury that if you violate that contract is <laughs> apocalyptic. So yes. it's just the nature of fans because you love it so much. So the yeah. nature of passion is vitriol. Yep. Um, so it's something to be very wary of. So I'm very conscious of it. But at the same time, if you democratize creativity, you homogenize it. So I can't listen to the fans. I can't give them what they think they want. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that I'm superior. It's not that I know better. It's that it's my story. And yeah. so I can't listen to it whatsoever. Because if I do that, it's going to feel different. Yeah. And that's not something I'm smart enough to balance of listening and then making it and tricking people into thinking that it was my idea. It has to be my idea. Otherwise, it's going to feel different. And so if there's things you don't like in the story, tough. It's my story. You know, and sorry, <laughs> like uh, the same guy doing it, the same things he likes, you know, and so that's all I can say about it. I wish it could live up to every expectation everyone has. I really do, because I love people love these characters and I have my own characters that I just adore ones both ones I've created, both ones I've read. You know, my childhood friends are populated with, you know, or populated by like Edmund Dantes and Luke Skywalker. You know, Edmund Dantes hasn't been done wrong, but other characters have. <laughs> um, no, I definitely think and it's it, it's interesting because I always I, I ask this question a lot because I think that it, mm. I think that inherently you do struggle, you know, because you like you have to be true to the characters you have to be true to yourself you have to be true to like where the story is going and inherently you know by doing that you are going to i think upset people but i think i but part of me again i love that i love i i can't i can't tell you when i go on these tiktoks and the people are so angry and i think to myself like but that means you loved it because yeah. if you're this crazy if this passionate throwing books across you know like screaming from the rooftops you finished it like you mm -hmm. <laughs> So mm -hmm. and like you're coming back to it. So it's like obviously mm -hmm. it's took a chord. And that's honestly, I think the work that you and so many um amazing fantasy writers today are doing so beautifully is striking those chords mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, setting that tone and love evoking love, that. <laughs> yeah. Love does not mean pleasing someone all the nope. time. Yes. Are are we attracted to people that are needy and want to please us all the time? No, no, yeah. we want pushback. Yep. We want the, the hard moments, really, it's because where it's respect comes from and differences and stuff. Something's always pleasing you. you yes. know. Nobody wants to. I mean, it, it's like the idea of like having a yes person. Nobody really wants to be told. Nobody, nobody wants to really. Be told I mean, very, very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Well, people look at it, look at it in relationships. What people say they want is not what they're attracted to. Oh, no. Really. No, no. And see, it all <laughs> comes full circle. I feel like we're in this, and I, I talk about this a lot, um, particularly like in house. I, I do kind of feel like we're in this this like amazing golden age of fantasy and like sci-fi. Mm. Like it's just mm -hmm. there's so much, you know. There's there's so many things that are being written that are just it's just amazing. And to see like you know authors building on other on other things that have been done, creating new worlds, 
like for me, where fantasy has always been, you know, and sci-fi and fantasy has always been a safe place. It's kind of, it's, it's so encouraging to see just other communities look at, and, and I kind of do see, you know, this, this, this sort of shift in, in science fiction and fantasy, where it is this sort of home for maybe, I mean, it's, I think it's always been a home for the outsiders, but also a home for like the LGBTQIA community mm-hmm. and, you know, kind of seeing this really safe space. And I like to, I also love to talk about this because I always think to myself, like, what is it? What is it about fantasy? What is it about science fiction? And I feel like I've gotten answers where it's like, well, you know, you can use it as like a, a metaphor to kind of talk about struggles, you know, and, or you can use it to create a universe in which you want to live in, you know, in a world mm-hmm. where you want to live in. So I think you've done, you've done a little bit of A and B. And <laughs> yeah, a little bit of A and B. <laughs> so, um, but why do you think, why do you think like this has become, you know, this sort of, and I hate to, you know, talk about genre in this way, but that these, that these books, how, what they mean to sort of the, the other. I think it's the idea of worlds where the acceptance of People who are different, perhaps mm-hmm. like LGBTQ or women, it's a different baseline. It's not the difference that is often focused on. So, for instance, in my books, I focus on the caste system, the eye colors, being representative of the myriad different myriad differences that uh, uh, humans have used to judge each other throughout time. It's not meant to stand in for uh, sexuality. It's not meant to stand in for race. It's meant to stand in for difference. Yeah. So. I think it's the concept of a different baseline. So a subject one can be talked about without people counter arguing based on their conceptions in this world, right? Because our egos are very much involved in this world. So when someone gives you a viewpoint you disagree with, you have an identity crisis. It yeah. really is existential. And so people's political leanings are far less likely to change in this world than they are to sympathize with the Rebel Alliance, perhaps, in Star Wars. And so I think, one, you come in without your armor. Yeah. Two, I think that women, LGBTQ, people who have been disenfranchised or gatekept for millennia, while their sexual orientation or their gender might be an intrinsic part of who they are, it is not all who they are. Mm -hmm. And so in our world, it's hard to sometimes get past someone prejudging you and making that your entire identity. I think it's the fantastical worlds, the science fiction worlds offer a place where they can explore all the other parts through characters who are judged based on other things, the other aspects of their character. They're literally the 99.9% of who they are. Exactly. As, as opposed to the label, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's it's wish fulfillment. Wish fulfillment is often misunderstood. It's It's not meant really as the audience wish fulfillment. That's like a Hollywood notion uh, that has kind of like popped into popular consciousness. It's really about uh, the wish fulfillment of the main character. So the main character getting to fulfill their wish, like Harry Potter getting to leave this ordinary life and be exceptional. Luke Skywalker to fly amongst the stars and be a warrior like his father, Jedi Knight like his father. That's wish fulfillment. It's best when it matches up with the audience. And so I think science fiction and fantasy, particularly with as many uh, female and LGBTQ writers that we have now, are able to pair up really well with that community. And also progressive writers who are like like my generation, which is like my default is much different. My baseline is much different than the baby boomer generation, for instance. And so we're writing sci-fi in a different way because we're taking things for granted. We're not focusing on these like really kind of banal allegories that are very transparent. We're not preaching our political opinions as so much as we're just creating the world that we think makes sense, you know? No, yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. And that is, I think that is the vibe. That is you definitely, know, you, yeah. you know, when bo- boomers try to be woke and <laughs> like, just watch like the new sex in the city. Like, my God, like it is the most cringy thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And it's, be- it's because they're like fetishizing race. They're fetishizing people's orientation. And then they're wearing it as a badge of honor. The whole point is to not treat people differently. Not to, Yes. And I think that is something where, again, it can, um, that, you know, I, and I think I love seeing it in this, in this space where it's like, it is just, we can create this world. We can kind of just live in it and we yeah. can sort of be more than one thing. Um, and I love it. I personally, I can't, I can't tell you, I can't say enough, um, how much I love that the science fiction world, the mm-hmm. fantasy world has become this safe space. Cause I do feel like mm-hmm. it definitely wasn't always 
the safe space. I think it's just really amazing to see. And it's just, um, it's just a great time. It's a great time to be reading science fiction fantasy. So you've expanded the Red mm-hmm. Rising uh, universe with a prequel in the Sons of Ares graphic mm-hmm. novels. Graphic novels are also my thing. So I got I have to, I had to give a little shout out. Um, it's a fabulous collaboration and sort of adds more to the the, the canon of your of your story of these novels. Mm-hmm. What made you jump over to the sort of comic uh, medium to explore these stories specifically? Was there anything where, you know, because I mean, they could have been, they could have, you could have done prequel novels, but you didn't. Yeah, if I do prequel novels, I want to do it in a very intentional way and have my complete focus. I mean, the difficulty is is brain power. You know, you, I, I'm a very singular individual. I'm a choo-choo train. It just goes one direction. And so graphic novels were a way for me to explore uh, because it's such a collaborative effort. Mm-hmm. It's a way for me to explore. I wanted to see Fitchner, his, his story. And I also didn't want to uh, explore territory that I might want to explore later on. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to write a book about Fitchner. Uh, but I thought that it was a very fun kind of mythic. There's something very mythic and heroic about the graphic novel medium. Obviously, we explore our own demigods in the form of superheroes. And so I wanted to explore the demigod in the Red Rising world, Ares, in the same medium. It's as simple as that. Nice. It's, it, it seemed to be the medium that would fit that story the best. And it's a mythic mythic uh, origin that is somewhat uncannily similar to Darrow's. And also, with the collaboration, I was able to have other people help pull the wagon, as opposed to me really getting it, getting in there. And that... Um, that was a lot of fun, but a very different experience. I love different mediums. I think when you can come to a universe, when you can come to a world and you can, as I think it does, a lot of us, um, to me, I look at like graphic novels, like a con- it's mm. just, it's the same as like audiobooks. Like some people want to, mm. how, how do you want to, how do you want to like a, take in your content? Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to listen to it? Do you want to, is that how, what excites you? Do you want to sort of visualize it? Do you need it visualized? Or again, can you visualize, like, is it that I want to visualize it myself that like, mm-hmm. I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. Um, so it's just really interesting. And I think it's fascinating and anyone uh, should check it out because it's it's wonderful. So you announced the seventh and final, and I have question marks around that <laughs> <laughs> um, book. Uh, in the uh, final, I need to spread my wings and fly away. <laughs> so there we go. We heard it. Yeah. Um, so you now saw last year at the San Diego Comic-Con, um, Red God. So that's book seven. And the, again, mm-hmm. the series has been with you for a while. What kind of emotions are sort of swirling around you as you embark on this well, sort of final chapter? Anxiety dreams of what comes next. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anxiety. <laughs> anxiety. Anxiety. It's strange. It's I. I it hasn't quite hit me yet. Mm-hmm. I'm 50 pages into writing it, and it's a lot of the work, a lot of the internal work of the characters was done in the last book. The stage is mm-hmm. set. So in Lightbringer, everyone has their the culmination of their final of their personal emotional odyssey. So the stage is set. The players have gone from cookie dough to cookies, <laughs> and to use the Buffy Vampire Slayer analogy. <laughs> And now it's just fun uh, to a degree, still horrific anxiety. But uh, I would say that for me, writing a book is so Herculean an effort. I I almost can't even uh, forecast the emotions that are coming and they'll come at different times. Yeah. And particularly when I realize like I'm having my last scene with a character or their last chapter and that'll, that I know the end of this book is going to be really hard. (laughs) And I also know that. The first, the first pages of the book were really hard. You don't want to make it so precious that you ruin the the the, the story by doing yeah. it. You don't want it to be so epic that it feels impersonal. You don't want it to feel so predetermined that it doesn't feel inspired moment to moment. And so, as you can tell with my slow speech pattern, <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like unlock. You're like, what am I feeling? Did right you now? see my existential crisis just happen? <laughs> I yeah. did a little bit, and now I feel yeah. a little guilty. Nah, it's all good. The, 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 the what, what, what's that old uh, saying from Joseph Campbell? The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. You I've go. always feared. I've always feared uh, ex- ending this series, but um, as you can tell by me doing three books and then six books and now seven books. <laughs> 
but it's it's come time. There's other stories I want to explore. And I think that each of these books has been different. Each one has had its own theme. And I feel as though it's finally culminating into a series-wide theme. And so it is the natural conclusion. Anything beyond this is I'll struggle to find new territory to explore. Yeah. So you were kind of, you kind of, so my next question was going to be, who are you going to miss the most? And you kind of were saying a little bit like how it's not going to hit you until you write that final Oh, it'll chapter. be Daryl. It'll be, it'll be, oh, oh man. Actually, will it be Daryl? Might be, might be Severo. Severo or Darrow or maybe mm. Victor. Yeah, I think it's because the, these characters serve as outlets often. Yeah. And Darrow's, the, their age will match mine when I complete this. And that is entirely intentional. And <laughs> I'm glad it all came full circle for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm all about circularity. So I, I feel as though those two characters are very split sides of my personality. And so I'll probably miss them the most. Oh, well, you did say you, you got to spread your wings. You got to you got to embark mm-hmm. on new things. You did mention the rigidness, I would say, a little bit of, you know, when you when you're writing more science, science fiction, um, mm-hmm. you gotta have to stay into some parameters. So are you thinking of writing more fantasy? Is that something that you can see on the horizon? Most things I'm attracted to will always be hybrids, I think. Mm-hmm. But yes, I'm interested in fantasy, particularly. I'll probably in books often or you stay within the sci-fi fantasy genre i'm much more interested in writing fantasy at this point than i am writing sci-fi though <laughs> yeah yeah so so the world building in the series uh it's a pretty incredible and if you want readers to sort of fully embrace or fully sort of immerse themselves you know you you need to deliver what you do so if you though were to write in any other fantastical world where would you go you know, when I was younger, I would have said Dune, but I think you can see the Dune influence on my books. So I think I <laughs> yes. explored that. I've, I've explored that to now. I think that there's an attraction. I, I'm very interested in um, medieval sagas and in mythology. So mm-hmm. playing within Tolkien's world would be a lot of fun. I think that the first or second age would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's very, very high language, which is. Nice. A lot of commas. I like that. I like that. (laughs) But at the same time, at the same time, I think that that would also feel like a constraint. Um, So I think that uh, another world that would be really fun to write in would be like, I'd love to do like an R-rated Harry Potter. Uh, (laughs) I would love. I think. I think you're among many. I think you're in good good company there. I think that there's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would have a very dark Harry Potter. (laughs) There's a lot. There's a lot that you can go off of that, but no, I love. Um, you see the Dune influence, which I think is mm. is 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 something that, and I kind of love that. You know, people are coming to it. it. You know, new obviously the movie. It's it's mm. wonderful, but you know, having having people kind of you know come to the book, Tolkien. Yeah, how do you how do you know? Yeah, it, it's quite strange. Not... When we, we, yeah, when when I was taking you know when I was taking Red Rising out, uh, many times I've been developing this for TV. <laughs> it was so annoying. I was competing against Dune. At, for various things like you know, it was it, because it was getting made and everyone knew it was getting made yep. and so i was getting no's because dune was coming out i'm like it's written in the 60s it's my turn <laughs> there's space for us all <laughs> oh yeah but that's not how hollywood works uh no no not at all but that's how uh, that's how the book community works and i couldn't even be mad because it's like herbert and i'm like yeah 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 denis villeneuve who I desperately wanted for Red Rising is doing doing like <laughs> I get why he'd rather do that, you know. I get it. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> but it is, it is interesting to see. And I will say, I mean, I think while I love while I love sort of this sort of fantasy, I think it is really great to see science fiction. And I always try to like tell people, you know, there's obviously there's a difference. Science mm-hmm. fiction, you know, real like the science in the science fiction are the people who mm-hmm. put more science in. in oh there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a big difference between hard and soft sci-fi. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I often uh, when I when I if I do need to go off in like a tangent on the different types of fantasy, and then and then you start to see eyes glaze over, and that's always my favorite part. Yeah, um, that, that's yeah. what I'm like. Would you like me to talk about the second age and Tolkien? And then yeah, I think exactly. everyone just clears the room. But so if you would like to write <laughs> write in that space. 
I think that's, I think that would be. That I think it's high, I think it's high time we see a story about a morally conflicted Balrog. <laughs> you know, he has all this dark power, this dark energy, his heart is made out of flame. He is a furnace inside, a furnace within burns. But he's just would way rather sculpt mountains into the effigy, the effigies of people from the the, the first age. And he doesn't really <laughs> want to go to war anymore. He's tired of Morgoth. He's just not that invested. So now we have the synopsis for your next book. So that's great. You so yeah. you're welcome. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the Balrog of Peace. Yeah, like that. yeah. Um, so this has been wonderful. I always like to to kind of close things out. Uh, I'm always looking for good book recommendations, uh, despite the fact that I'm literally consumed by. Oh books. goodness gracious! Yeah, <laughs> but so I got to ask you, what are you reading now? Or I always give them up because I know sometimes you know you get into mm-hmm. it. You're you're writing. You're you're doing other things, or what was the last book that you read that truly, that truly like you couldn't stop, you couldn't stop talking about? I, I really don't think you're going to be interested in what I read. I am interested. I am and so we are niche. all interested. I'm so niche. Okay. Last great book I read was the, um, the Afghan campaign by Stephen Pressfield. It was a reread. It's Alexander's campaign in Afghanistan after crushing the Persian empire. And the similarities to our modern wars um, in Afghanistan. And um, yeah, it's very niche. Stephen Pressfield <laughs> wrote Gates of Fire, which was his most successful book. Yes. But I, 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 you know, last like two years, all I've been reading is all I've been reading is books that have sold, you know, like 10,000 copies. <laughs> yeah, like the, I'm clearly, um, this is my band. This is where I'm it's saying. It's like, they're, they're, you know, I'm, the, Stephen Pressfield is a very successful author, but a lot of these other books, like there's this great series uh, called, this, uh, you know what? This is exactly why I should recommend these books because not enough people are reading them. See, uh, there you go. <laughs> yes, there's a great, great author by the name of Christian Cameron who writes about uh, the uh, ancient Greeks in military escapades in uh, ancient Greece. My favorite is called "Killer of Men" by er, uh, about a character named Aramnestos Aram, Aram from Boeotia, back in the Battle of Marathon, way back when we're talking like 490s, <laughs> 490s BC people. When the first Persian invasion came, not the one in, uh, yeah, no, not the one in 300, the one before that. People, not the 300 People, one. Not the 300 one. <laughs> the one before that. It's where we get the word marathon. Um, the Battle of Marathon, the Persians landed and the Athenians called all their allies to join them. And no one came except for about like 500 to 1,000 men from Boeotia led by Aramnestos. This contribution was so significant to Athenian culture that only other heroes put on the PNICS, uh, the uh, the where their congressional body of Athens yeah. met. Um, the only other, the only people on there who were not Athenians were the Boeotians, and they're these like hayseed farmers who are like right smack dab between Thebes and uh, Athens. And the Boeotians came, and the Athenians honored them, and they came to their aid a long time later when the Thebes were being thugs. And anyway. It's a great book series. There's like six of them. Aram Nestos is the leader from uh, from Boeotia, and he is a vicious, rage filled man. I love it. <laughs> in fact, I always say this is fact is 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 stranger than fiction. Things that you don't uh, you don't believe are real, and this is why this is why it's important. Healthy diet, people. You get your fantasy. Yeah. You get your regular yeah. fiction. You get your nonfiction. You get your history. Let's all oh, yeah. let's all come together here. Let's and all come let's... together. <laughs> honestly, I honestly, yeah, like maybe I maybe I I think for like two years solid, I've just read like military historical fiction. So I think I need to broaden my horizons. Can you recommend me anything? Oh, I uh, I can. So you you're on west you're West Coast, right? I am. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to recommend, which is the book I've been recommending to everyone right now, a book called Open Throat Open by Henry Throat. Hope. Okay. Okay. It is about a mountain lion. P twenty two, which I'm assuming you might be. I've seen with. Penny. I've just, I've seen P twenty two in the flesh. He scared the so hell out of me. It is time. essentially they don't ever really say if it's P twenty two, but you, if you if you know, you know, kind of thing. Okay. Um, it's about a mountain lion who lives under the Hollywood sign and sort of just incredible. You know, from it's from it's it's a taken from the point of view of the mountain lion, which and I will tell you, I am not generally a fan of animal. Like narrators, that's not really my thing. Oh, uh, you're gonna have a hard time in book seven when it's soft <laughs> the entire time through. 
But no, no, no. I make exceptions. I make plenty of exceptions. And this is one of them. And it is just fabulous. It's kind of almost told in verse. It's like a hundred, it's like more of a novella. It's like 160 pages. I've literally read it twice already because like you finish it and then you kind of are like, I have to go back. Like I need Mm. to, did I miss something? Like not Mm. that I missed something, but like I want to kind of devour it again. And I, and that is, um, that is a pun. If you, when you read the book. Um, I I was staying away from the pun. Because it, oh, it could be a euphemism. So. Yeah, it's a little bit. It's got an ending where it's just like, you know, the, the end of the book and you're kind of, it's that where you you think it's going to go one way and then it doesn't go the way you expect. But it to what, what we were talking about before, it's kind of the way it had to be. Turns out it's not actually Mountain Lion. No. <laughs> it's Jared Leto doing method acting. Yes. I, that... I don't want to be, I don't want to be this good at calling, you know, <laughs> twists in the story out it's a curse really i can't read anything without guessing you know yeah so i'm sorry about ruining the ending for everyone. no 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 i think i think it's still it's still worth the read and um yeah it is and it's it's not um you know i i always say to people i think um i read a lot of fantasy and so it's like a lot of the books i read yours included you're gonna mm. kill me with 800 pages <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I, so, I, I'm imagining you paid full price for this uh, open throat, right? It, absolutely. Are they, absolutely. They, they sold at the same price? <laughs> yeah, I think I need to write 150-page novels from now on. And so, yeah, and so I, I will tell you when I get, and it could be, an, you know, when I get the chance to read a novella, um, and that's another thing I, I think I, I really love when, even within, like, these hulking sagas, uh, every now and then they're like, oh, I'm going to throw in a novella. And I'm like, that's okay that's okay. Mm. I need a break. Mm. I need to take a break. I oh, yeah. I'm happy to read. I'm happy to read a, um, I'm happy to do a little 160, uh, 160 page novella, but I will tell you from, and I've got my old copy right here. We'll be that for a oh, yeah. yeah. And now that, here. Yeah. yeah. What <laughs> so. the hell is wrong with that? I am. <laughs> yeah. Like my, my, my mentor who's like this old uh, lawyer, uh, the old Hollywood lawyer, he's this like really enigmatic character. He's like, are you trying to make less money? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, dude, I don't know why I'm saying like, four times that. the effort. <laughs> yeah, four times the effort for four times a bigger book. You know, it's like <laughs> I ask myself this question too. And I'm just like, why do I? <laughs> no, but I will say, I mean, sometimes you gotta, I mean, when you're in it, you're in it. And then you want those pages. Uh, I was just oh, saying yeah. to someone. Well, as a reader, it's great, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's true. Sometimes, you know, an extra, you think those extra pages, it equates to an extra five minutes with that character, an extra five minutes in that universe. And that, that's everything. Oh, so man, it was, yeah, my, uh, the book was being listed on Audible for some reason, for like as like 13 hours long. And I, I had quite a few um, upset fans by that. And it's not, it's like 28 hours long or something like that. I was going to say, I'm like, that's a, that's a speed reader. That's yeah, reading yeah. really yeah. fast. But 13 hours is still like, that's a hefty tome, you know? It's true. You go to a movie, it's only two and a half hours. Maybe it's three. Yeah. Yeah. 28 yeah. hours of oh my enjoyment. God. My poor reader, Tim Gerard Reynolds. <laughs> you're, you're wonderful readers. Oh, All right, yeah. with that, um, Pierce, thank you again. This Thanks, has been guys. wonderful. Uh, yeah. Lightbringer, the sixth book in the Red Rising series is out now. It's awesome. Read it, buy it, love it. <laughs> buy two, buy three. There you buy, go. I can't count, buy 10. <laughs> All right. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of The Lightbringer. I'm Mark at my Barnes & Noble here in Cincinnati, and I am joined by one of my favorite book buddies, Madison in L.A. Hi, Madison. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Why don't you go ahead and uh, kick us off today? I would love to because one of my favorite genres is fantasy, so anytime I get to talk about it, uh, it's a fun time. So when I was thinking about books to recommend with Lightbringer, I chose Nevernight by Jay Kristoff, and this story... I love this story. It's action-packed. It has assassins. It's always a good time when assassins are involved. So this story follows a girl, Mia, who joins a school of assassins to seek vengeance against the powers that killed her father during a failed rebellion. So through this, Mia... She barely escaped her father's failed rebellion with her life, and now she is kind of in hiding 
kind of finding her own because she's being sought after by not only the Senate, but also her father's friends. So she's kind of getting people wanting to kill her from both sides. So she has no real place she can go. But her talent is that she can speak to shadows. And these shadows lead her to the door of a retired killer, which then furthers the plot into this assassin school. And she's thrown in with the deadliest assassins of her generation. And she has to best them in not only stealing, but poisons, subtle arts. She has to do it all um, so she can be inducted into the Blades of the Lady of Blessed Murder, which is a mouthful and a lot to wrap your head around. But then there's a killer inside the church's walls and Mia's secrets are being threatened to be exposed. So you kind of have to see her. She's a character that acts on her feet. It's very fast paced. You get to know her, but she's very like quick witted, kind of everything you want in that female heroine. And I like to think that if Mia was in the same world as where Lightbringer takes place, her and Daryl would get along quite well, um, which is why I chose Nevernight by Jay Kristoff. What do you have for us, Mark? Ah, fantastic pick. And I like that you chose something fantasy because Pierce Brown kind of leans a little bit more science fiction. But I think you're right in that Mia and this sort of quest for vengeance, like has a lot of great through lines for the Red Rising series. So nice choice. I went with uh, something a little bit more hard sci-fi. I've been thinking about this book a little bit lately. Uh, just because of the popularity of Dune and, of course, Pierce Brown's anything is always exciting to think about and talk about. But it made me think of a classic futuristic sci-fi book called Hyperion by Dan Simmons. Dan Simmons is usually known for historical literary horror. He's got very dense titles that he explores a lot of themes with, but his take on sci-fi is incredible. It is a collection of connected novellas that are all uh, told from different points of view of each of these uh, six characters. So think kind of Canterbury Tales in space. It's weird, but just stick with me. So you have a group of people who are on a pilgrimage to the planet Hyperion, where uh, the potential for universal prospects lie, along with a very terrible, dangerous creature. Each of these pilgrims has their own reasons for this quest and this journey. Uh, And the world build and the actual narrative plot unfolds in these really incredible layers as you follow each of these characters. So jumping in, there's no hand-holding. You really don't know what you're getting into. But as you follow each of these characters' stories, you start to uncover what is really happening and this entire world that he has built. Um, It has a very Frank Herbert kind of weight to it, as in there is a lot to take in, but it's told beautifully. I love the structure of this book. I also think that his analysis of humankind is very interesting. And I think the range of his genre blending is always appreciated. I think Dan Simmons is great about plucking all kinds of different periods and pieces and themes into any of his work. And I think this is no exception. So you think about Asimov, you think about Bradbury, you think about Pierce Brown, you think about N.K. Jemisin, and you think about Dan Simmons because of this book. All of these authors are speculative authors who really have a place in a pantheon, and I think this book and Dan Simmons really deserves a place alongside some of the best. So Check out Hyperion by Dan Simmons. But guess what? That's all we have for today. Thanks for tuning in to Pour It Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. Uh, I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And where can we follow you, Madison? I'm Madison. You can follow my home store at BN Events Group. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and happy reading. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.